type dark matter model, so it won't be too interesting in the dark matter part, I guess, but it will be in an, in an unusual and hopefully interesting cosmological, cosmological history. And of course, we know, and this used to work, yes. So, you know, obviously dark matter exists. We know this from many observations, and we know the amount of dark matter in our universe. And we are, as physicists, we are also very curious about what dark matter is. So on Saturday evening, we watched a nice uh, documentary movie about particle physics, and then there was a Q&A afterwards with, the, um, I assume, who was the producer and one of the actors in the movie. He, he said he doesn't really care about dark matter, he was more into quantum gravity. <laughs> it, was, it was funny for, uh, sorry, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was, it was funny for a group of uh, physicists who came here to study dark matter, but in my mind, all particle physicists can be divided into two categories. Ones who really want to know what dark matter is, and ones who really, 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 really want to know what dark matter is. And then there's the director of the movie. Yeah, and then there's the director of the movie. Hopefully, who is not a physicist, or at least not a particle physicist. Yeah, so uh, of course we don't know what dark matter is. This is why we are searching for it. And what we know about dark matter is um, really, you know, we know the, the, the dark matter um, makes up about 20% of the universe's energy density and it interacts mostly, if not only, fingers crossed that it's not only, <laughs> interacts gravitationally, and it's um, probably cold and collisionless and then does not clump much. And these are the, the ones with the question marks, of course, they are not you know, concrete as, um, as most of you would know. But uh, these are only, of course, astrophysical observations, since we haven't observed dark matter, uh, direct dark matter, or we haven't observed dark matter in our colliders. And of course, um, having only these astrophysical observations, we, you know, we really need more to know about the particle properties of dark matter. And as particle, well, I am coming from a particle physics background, as I assume most of you, uh, that's why I think the dark matter as a particle, <laughs> in, <laughs> intuitively, <laughs> and I find this comic um, like, that describes my feelings about dark matter as well. When, you know, says once you have a collider, every problem starts to look like a particle. So, and um, if we assume that dark matter, well, you don't need to assume that dark matter is a particle, but uh, the dark matter scenarios or what could be dark matter spans a huge range of uh, parameter space in terms of both mass and the interaction with the standard model. And we'll come to the interaction with the standard model. This plot is, you know, you, you, might, you must have seen many versions of this, these um, graphics basically describing the dark matter, possible dark matter masses and interactions. And as you can see, the for masses, you can go down to 10 to the minus 33 G, so it's like 10 to the minus 30 MeV up to uh, up to you know, several solar masses, and for interactions, you can also um, you can also have orders of magnitude in terms of um, in terms of interaction rates. And of course, you know they have many many dark matter models that that can possibly be correct, right? And we just don't know what don't know them. Um, so. As I said, I will actually talk about a very one dark matter model, which will be just a weak interacting dark matter, dark, dark matter, and we will change the cosmological history that, that the dark matter evolves through. But before doing that, I just want to walk you through about the, uh, about uh, the generic scenario for dark matter, so that you know you are fresh uh, in thinking what can we change about this cosmological history. So in a very, um, very generic scenario, dark matter is probably thermally produced in the early universe, and one assumes that it's produced with all the, other st all the standard model particles. So and that's you know, one reason to, a, a good reason in my mind to assume that dark matter should interact with the standard model particles, because you know, it is probably produced from the same, th same source. And again, we are assuming that the universe was hot and the dark matter was thermally produced. And dark matter analyzed via its interactions, its you know, possible interactions uh, with the standard model. So you have some you know, two to two uh, annihilation basically. And this is in the early universe. The universe is expanding and cooling. So as the universe cools and expands, the you know, this uh, annihilation, annihilation rate goes down, and when of course uh, the annihilation rate becomes smaller than the expansion rate of the universe, the annihilations freeze out, and this is just a thermal freeze out scenario. And, and generically, we can feel like it just sees from a certain angle. Maybe this would be better. Ah, anyway, oops, sorry. 
yeah, so you know, as I said, when the annihilation uh, annihilation switches off, this gives you a, 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 a this basically corresponds to an interaction strength that tells you, you know, the the uh, the size of the the possible interactions. And if we if we follow the uh, the dark matter co-moving number density, and this is just a generic hand-drawn plot uh, for coming in dark matter density versus time. Here, this unit is just a dark matter mass over some temperature. You know, our dark matter starts with uh, following the equilibrium number density, and at some point, these interactions freeze out. These are annihilations freeze out, and then when they freeze out, you have a frozen, you know, a freeze out density of dark matter. And if your annihilation cross section is, of course, larger, then your uh, freeze out number density will be smaller because more of them would have annihilated, right? So for a generic dark matter mass of about 100 GeV, which is about the, the electroweak scale, this corresponds to an annihilation cross-section, or the observed dark matter number density uh, requires an annihilation cross-section of about 10 to the minus 36 centimeter uh, square, which is about the uh, about the weak, uh, weak interaction rate. Uh, and this is why, as you know, this is why it's called the weakly interacting uh, massive particle or the WIMP miracle. And you know, one uh, possible problem with the WIMP miracle is that we haven't observed WIMP yet, yet and the parameter space is, is getting for, uh, like kind of squeezed out. This is an old plot from 2018 from Xenon 110, and we saw many different versions of this plot um, with different experiments as well. For example, here you see also the LUX and Panda X results, and um, you know, they have, uh, they, um, they <coughs> There are many. Uh, there are more uh, experiments coming up, and then they have. They have. They will be covering even more parameter space. But um, this is also a very crude idea of where the where the, the WIMP theory should be. And as you can see, the experiments are you know get uh, cutting into a lot of the a lot of the theory space. So WIMP is. Should yes. Should, should I? So I haven't looked at this in a while, but should I interpret the fact that the bound is above the screen as a slight excess? No, I don't think so. Uh, yes, sorry. If there is anyone from Xenon, the, so Graham is pointing out that this, the the um, the black line, yeah, the black line is above kind of where the green is. Yeah. Black line is above the green. Yeah, no, no, black line is the, the data. Yeah, is the data. Right. Yeah. Okay, so one point, one point two sigma. <laughs> yeah, right. So this is, I guess, the two sigma. This is one sigma. Um, right. So I haven't given up really on WIMPs yet, but they are um, you know, not looking great. <laughs> Uh, so again, the, the assumptions that go into that, okay, so this is, um, what is, so the theory part is, right, the, the theory part is basically, uh, uh, again, um, it includes, for example, SUSE models where you have some, you know, maybe a, a, a light is neutrally noise or dark matter, then, then it would have some weak interaction, you know, weak scale interactions and then freeze out as a, a thermal freeze out. So that's what the theory is. And then, of course, experiment is just, um, experiment is looking for WIMP nucleon, WIMP nucleon interactions, right? And on the theory side, the, the, the way that the dark matter freeze out density is um, set, or the dark matter number density now is set, just depends on your, on your model. And I only showed you the freeze out scenario, for example, but you could have had a freeze in scenario or some, some other, uh, other cold production of dark matter. The, the, another, the other set of assumptions that, that goes into all these calculations, theoretical calculations, is the, the cosmological history of the universe. For example, in, um, in most generic beam scenarios, your dark matter would have frozen out when the universe is uh, the radiation dominated, and then it follows a certain, you know, it follows the certain, um, certain expansion, expansion routine, basically. For example, in with the just with the standard model plus you know a, a dark matter particle, if you know these are the only ingredients in in our universe, you will start from a hot universe. 
And then at some point, you know, there are many interesting things that happen in the early universe. The, the uh, interesting things usually for my research is, is for example, at about 150, 130 GeV or so, we have uh, the electroweak phase transition when the, the Higgs you know, gets a, gets a non-zero wave. Uh, above this, the Higgs wave is zero. And when the Higgs gets a wave, uh, standard model particles, the ones that get their masses through the, through the uh, Higgs mechanism, become massive, right? And if your dark matter is, for example, about 100 GB or so, and if it's an electro, uh, if it's a WIMP, uh, the dark matter annihilations freeze out, usually around uh, the, when the temperature falls to about a tenth of the dark matter mass, tenth or twentieth. So for 100 GB, the freeze out, the, the dark matter freeze out would happen around 10 GB. So this is below the electroweak scale, but it is above some other scale, which will be important for this talk, and that scale is the QCD, uh, the QCD confinement scale. So in the standard model, quarks and gluons, they confine into hadrons at around GeV or a few hundred MeV. This is when the, the QCD coupling becomes large. And this, you know, this could have happened in the early universe as, as well. It probably happened in the, in the early universe. And, and then this is another scale. And then below that, the, the other important scale will be is, for, uh, is when BBN happens as the Big Bang nuclear synthesis, when, the, uh, the, when a few of the light nuclei start forming like uh, helium, deuterium, tritium, beryllium, lithium, you know, uh, and yeah, I think these are the only ones that happen uh, that form. And, and that happens at about um, a few MeV to maybe 10 MeV. You know, it, it goes on for a while, but the start is about is, is around uh, order 10 MeV. <coughs> right. So again, the, the freeze out in a, in a standard cosmology with standard dark matter interaction. And when I say standard, we will only be looking at uh, dark matter. You know, say dark matter will be a fermion, a dark fermion. It interacts with the with the standard model particles via mediator. The mediator can be either a scalar or a vector. Okay, and um, the freeze out happens above the QCD scale, and but below the electroweak uh, electroweak. Um, Symmetry breaking, and for this talk, we will only look at interactions with quarks. Of course, you can also have the same interactions with similar interactions with leptons as well. All right. So uh, Tim and I, um, a few years ago, started thinking about what if the universe, uh, the early universe, was a bit different than what we would have expected from uh, from standard model. And one way you can change the early universe. So first of all, we don't really know anything about the BBN scale. Empirically, like we don't have data. The, the earliest we can observe so far into the, the history of our universe is basically the, the light element abundances. We kind of know what happened at BBN. We know it relatively well. It, you know, it gives us nice constraints about the, you know, our models that can change the early universe. There is slight room for, uh, for BSM, model, BSM models, but standard model interactions, like nuclear interactions and everything, explains BBN relatively well. So, and this happens at about 10 MeV. I want to emphasize that our universe doesn't have to be that hot. Maybe it only, like, maybe the reheating was only up to a GeV or like 100 MeV. This really could have happened, but it's, you know, it's better to assume, it's better for model building to assume that universe was hot at some point because, um, oh, but first, why not? Also, then there you have more room to do, more room to do BSM physics. Anyway, so Tim and I have been thinking, you know, how do we know that the QCD confinement happened at the standard model, uh, standard model value in the early universe? And what, if, what, what happens if the, the QCD confinement happened in, at, at an earlier temperature? Right? And people, uh, th th there were already um, models thinking that maybe QCD was always confined from just from, you know, until um, since inflation, basically. But, uh, but this is, you know, the way that we do it is a bit different than those. Anyway, so, so the, the gist of the, this new model will be generic dark matter interactions, just dark matter interacting with standard model particles via, you know, scalar or vector mediators, but in a different, in a different cosmological history. In a history specifically when the QCD confinement happens at a temperature, maybe 100 GV or TV, it's just much, much uh, higher than the, uh, what you would expect from, uh, what you would expect the dark matter uh, thermal freeze out would be, and also, um, I say 100 GV, but we also assume it to be actually above the electroweak symmetry breaking scale. So imagine 200 GV to up to 500 GV. 
So, and I will give you a one slide QCD recap. Just this is just the, the part of that uh, part that is important for us. We know QCD is asymptotically free, and it becomes strongly interacting at, at low energy. So this is you know this is temperature in lieu of energy and the QCD uh, in QCD coupling constant alpha s. Well, it's gs squared over four pi, and um, so this is for this is for a standard model. And I haven't really put in the the quarks that are going out of equilibrium here, but um, don't worry about that. This is just a picture. Anyway, so you know, at very high energies, the the QCD coupling constant is small, so quarks are uh, quarks and gluons are asymptotically free. But as the temperature as the temperature drops, of course, the interaction strength strengths get higher, and larger and larger, and at some point at order one GeV, the quarks and gluons confine into hadrons. This is a this is a phase transition in the standard model. It is thought to be uh, a, a, um, not a first order phase transition; it's just a continuous transition. But in some BSM models, it also could be first order, which Tim and I looked at to explain Bayern asymmetry. But this talk is not about Bayern asymmetry, so it's not important what the order of the phase transition is. Right. So this is what happens in the standard model, and as I said, uh, we Can yes. So the, it, so the 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 exact position of lambda QCD really depends oh, on yeah. the representation of, of the quarks, right? I mean, the effective yeah. interaction between the quarks. So if you change, if uh, you consider things that are not in fundamental representation, does it change the type of phase transition and what happens there? Um, yes, yes, right, 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 right. Of course. Uh, well. I guess you can. So, the, oops, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, right. So, the way that you can change the the QCD phase transition or the, the place of the QCD phase transition is if you have. So, okay. So, the the um, the the QCD scale lambda QCD like depends on the the number of number of flavors. This is number of flavors that are below the QCD scale at the time, and. Um, Right, right. And also the representation, that's right, also the representation, right, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. These, so we are not actually changing the quark number and the quarks are only the standard model. Here, what we, what we did is add a, a dimension five uh, interactions. That, so this is a, the scalar field phi that interacts with the gluon uh, field strength. So this is a phi GG. It's not phi GG dual, right? You have this for axions, for example, which would give you a phi, phi GG dual kind of interaction. This is a scalar, and it doesn't have a Z1, Z2 symmetry, so you can have this interaction. And so dimension five interaction, so there's a scale that's M star. This can come from, for example, a, a heavy, um, heavy uh, vector fermions. This is fine. We are agnostic to what happens, or this could be a dilaton-like interaction. Sorry. This is so. Yes. But to change the representation, I mean, you have to go to, to representation is kind of parametrically larger than the fundamental. Because I mean, say from, from right. The right. Yeah, yeah. 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 From, from uh, to I don't think so. I mean, so, I'm not an expert, probably, in that more. But I think the 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 strength of the of the you know, kind of effective interactions goes like the quadratic half of the representation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But yeah. it could be. If you go from the fundamental to the I joint, you could you can acquire an order of magnitude of breaking. Why do you go from four to three? It's not done. No, no, I think people go up to higher yeah, representations. It goes up to higher representations. Yeah, 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 yeah. You have to change the representation, I think, parametrically larger than that. Right. Well, it is a. The standard model is very close to actually being at the point where it goes from one behavior to the other. So you don't have to change the model. Right, yeah, yeah. I don't. I have a, I have a skip slide, but not for representation. But like standard model is really in a you know yeah as Tim was saying at least from lattice studies up to now it is in a point that it, it could just change. The newer lattice studies you know see that the the, the phase transition might be a, a continuous transition for a larger um, a larger parameter space around the standard model. Let's say, but that's not yeah that's not known. Yeah. Also, the QCD scale is that this, this, the position of the scale depends how you define it, and also is, is that it depends on these parameters exponentially, right? And the position doesn't tell you what the order of the phase transition is either. You know, it could be a higher, uh, lambda QCD can be higher, but still be a second order transition, so those are not the same things. 
But here, in this case, we changed the, the position of the, the phase transition in a, uh, using a, basically a scalar field that gets a vacuum expectation value. So if you think of, this, think of these interactions, so this is 1 over gs squared is just a standard model, standard model interaction strength, and then you are adding, a, uh, and then there's another part that comes from these effective interactions. And if this phi field, the scalar field, gets a vacuum expectation value, v phi, you basically have an effective interaction strength, which depends on the, the, the vacuum expectation value of a scalar. So this, this vacuum expectation value, if it is zero, then you're you know, back to the standard model in a way. And if it is a different value, then you, can, you have a dynamical QCD scale. Because the QCD scale is, you know, you can think of the QCD scale as when this, uh, when this interaction strength becomes large or becomes order one or becomes order four pi, for example, right? So if the V5, for example, changes, then you have a dynamical QCD scale. And this, Q this new QCD scale, you can parameterize this as lambda QCD standard model. This is you know, 1 GV or 400 MeV, however, um, wherever you put your square root twos, I, uh, wherever you put your square root twos, but it's, you know, so this new QCD scale will be lambda QCD standard model times this exponential, which again, the number of this NF is the number of flavors that are lighter than the QCD scale, and this, uh, this fraction, which is V5 over M star. And M star is the, you know, the scale of this, these, um, so this dimension five operator. Dependence of the temperature of this Sorry, say it again? What is V5? Uh, I will talk about the I will talk about the, the finite temperature potential a bit, but for in terms of well, it depends on how you know what else you have for interactions for the scalar field, right? Unless we for this part we are assuming it is constant and then it changes you know spontaneously as some other as some other um, phase transition, but we can talk about it later. All right? Yes. Yeah. It just it just depends on what the interactions of these you know of the scalar field is. If for example if it interacts with the the Higgs field or uh, you know, it will always interact with the scalar, uh, the, the, with the gluon strength, and you put that in as, you know, as a feedback, and you, know, you technically you solve the v, v phi uh, from a finite temperature potential. The assumption here is roughly constant. Uh, what I'm showing you is yes, just assuming it is constant. So, for example, if you, you can change v phi over m s, again, it's, it doesn't have a, a z two symmetry. Um, uh, we assume that at very high temperatures, maybe V5 was zero, and then at some, um, at some temperature here, we pick it to be 4 TeV, but you can, uh, you can change that. Anyway, at some point, uh, maybe the scalar field goes under a phase transition, then which, after which it acquires a vacuum expectation value, and then when it acquires a vacuum expectation value, you are effectively changing the, the QCD, QCD strength, which you know, can give you a jump on the QCD scale. For example, for a V5 over a mass of about 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.5, which is not a, you know, too large a number, your QCD scale would be uh, 200 GeV, and if it is about 0 0.3, it will be you know, 30 GeV or so. So this is how you can change. This is one way that you can change the QCD scale. So again, yes. M star is the mass of the scale? No, no, M star is some scale. So you think of it as a lambda star. <laughs> but I didn't want to have too many lambdas in the effective theory. So, but. Um. Yes. So is there, how's that M star going to be? Yeah, how's that M star going to be? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't remember if I have it in the, at the end of the slice. I think I do. So you can technically probe this, this interaction at the LAC, right? It's a phi GG. And you can think of it as, well, okay, there are no studies of looking for phi GG directly, but there are, uh, there are studies for axion-like particles, like phi, when phi is a pseudoscalar, it will be GG dual. And that also comes with a, you know, QCD scale, basically. You can think of it as, not, sorry, axion scale, right? Like an F, FA. Um, we use those constraints to say that M star should be maybe above a few TeV, but it's not clear that you can take the same constraints to, to, uh, you know, to constrain a phi, a phi GG interaction. But you can think of it as the, the cross-section for producing phi from proton-proton you know, collisions, right? So it was the mass of phi Yes, so that also depends on, of course, your model. So one model that we looked at, so it was order, order 10 GeV for a model that we did to explain the Bayonet symmetry. It was a light scalar. So these would be here from the So yes, but the, the better way to, well, not better way, but 
in a model that we looked at again for the Bayern symmetry, we coupled it to the Higgs field as well, so it will be mixing with the Higgs. So, I mean, like, why does you see IGF signal? Yeah, yeah, so that's what I said. So, the, the, the studies that are, are for axion-like particles, for 5GG dual, this is from like gluon fusion, fusion and decay to jets, but for 5GG dual, they, you can look at, for example, angular distributions, and, and you know, that gives you a good handle, basically, but angular distributions are easier to alter with pseudoscalar interactions than scalar interactions, is my understanding. So it's not clear those same constraints apply to 5GG. And the, the group that looked, was looking at it, or had looked at the axion-like particles, Belen Gavella and uh, Jose Miguel No and some other people from um, IFD, they had promised me that they were looking at 5GG as well, but then that was three years ago and I haven't seen the paper yet, so, so I don't know. <laughs> if anyone is interested, please do look at the 5GG, yes. Uh, so I have a question. So if you, if you change the electricity for ice cream, don't you also change the position for heavy collisions? Uh, no, 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 heavy collisions are, so, the, okay, yes and no. Heavy collisions are going up to a finite temperature of only one GeV, so you don't, like, so maybe I will come to that. It's, you know, this is happening at very, very high temperatures, okay. right? The only way to probe the high, like the new QCD in that sense would be having collisions that run at very high temperatures. You know? So like in stars, which is the prediction? No, those are still not high enough. So it's like, it's like, this is like a TV temperature, right? Temperature is different than just energy in terms of that. Yeah. Can you probe it by doing collisions at very high density? You, can, you can't have, temp yeah, if you, ha if you were having collisions at very high temperature, yes, but like LHC is zero temperature, just high energy, right? Uh, you, don't have a, you don't have equilibration. No, neutron stars are like MEV temperatures. No, no. Like high density. Density. Oh, high density. Oh, high density. High density, I, I'm not sure. Probably still not, but I, I haven't thought about high density. Yeah, good. But, yeah, still, it's still, I would say, for, to, for probing the different QCD scale. Of course, the, the, the scalar field, again, depending on your model, it can be as light as a few GeV, and then you can produce a scalar and like, you know, probe if it, con if it interacts with the gluon f gluons and stuff, right? You can, you can look for that, but probing actual the, the um, QCD scale, I don't know. One thing that I haven't looked at yet and I really wanted to is, um, so okay, so let me just go one more slide. <laughs> Okay, yes, so, so in terms of, yeah. I know, when you have a dark matter talk, you should talk about dinosaurs. <laughs> but this is the picture I have in mind, is that like, currently we know the QCD scale because we know our proton, I mean, we also measure it at the LAC and stuff, but we also know that our protons are, you know, the mass of, you know, the proton is, it's about one GB basically. And of course, the proton and like all the other, like these hadrons get most of their masses from the QCD scale. This is just another good handle to know about the QCD scale. So currently we know that our QCD scale is about, you know, like order one GB or whatever, a few hundred MeV basically. Well, so what I'm saying is, in the very, very early universe, this, Q this, Q this QCD scale might have been different, but it really has to come back down to the standard model QCD at some point, and preferably before BBN, or it has to come back to the standard model QCD scale before BBN, right? So one question I think one can ask is, how close do you need to be to BBN? And you know, this you can probably ask by changing the proton and, well, if you're changing the QCD scale, you're changing the proton and neutron mass, which you know, affects the, the interactions that set the light, light element abundances, right? You can ask, how close can I get to the BBN scale with a different proton mass, for example? You know, do I need to recover the QCD scale at you know, 5 MeV, 10 MeV, 1 GeV? So I assume one can ask this question. I don't know if you know, one would get reasonable answers to that. So this is, this is one way to probe a, a different uh, QCD scale a la you know, nucleon masses, basically, in the early universe. But other than, that, other than that, at the colliders, you would really have to go to that temperatures, and we haven't even, um, we barely go up to the QCD, like one GeV temperatures, or a few hundred MeV temperatures at uh, heavy ion collisions. So I don't see the higher temperatures happening anytime soon. If they can happen, I actually don't know the theory much, if you can go up to very high temperatures. All right, so the, 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 for the early universe, what is important and what's important for, uh, for dark matter as well, things that depend on the QCD scale will be different in the, in the early universe because we are changing the QCD scale, right? So if you, for example, we can 
have a, a little comparison, and you know, I will go into details, but if you, if you make a little comparison, for example, if the, so in the standard model, confinement scale is, you know, I'm taking it to be 400 MeV, the mass of the, uh, so at 400 MeV, the only quarks that are uh, light compared to the scale is the up and down quarks, maybe a little bit of strange, but like not really, for, for uh, purposes of, you know, look, thinking about the QCD, uh, QCD confinement. And if your confinement scale is, for example, 400 GV, you know, uh, about a thousand times uh, higher, in this case, all quarks would be massless than the, or lighter than the QCD scale. I mean, for 400 GV, all quarks are massless anyway because it's above the electroweak phase transition. So, um, so you know, one thing that um, I think Tim was saying too, for example, if you have more than, you know, if you have six massless quarks when QCD confines, that probably changes the, the, uh, the order of the phase transition. So uh, theoretically, it is thought that if you have three or more massless quarks, QCD phase transition should be a first order phase transition. Newest lattice studies are saying that even up to six and seven massless quarks, it will still be a crossover transition, but you know, there are not that many lattice studies. But anyway, it is expected that if, if you, when you have more and more lighter light quarks, your QCD phase transition changes. Again, that's not necessarily saying that the scale will be different. Yes? Yeah, so I will come to that. <laughs> so, the, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so again, one thing, that, one thing that depends on the QCD scale is, for example, the pion masses. So, this is the standard model here. K, uh, this, this parameter kappa is like the QQ bar condensed set. You know, it is a couple of hundred, uh, as scale is a couple of hundred MeV cube. And uh, this depends also on the pion decay constant F pi, which is about order 100 MeV. So, these are all like kind of QCD scales. And these, these actually depend on the QCD scale. And of course, the pion masses depend on the light quark masses as well. So if you have, a, for example, a different QCD, pions would be heavier just because the QCD scale is higher. So these parameters that depend on the QCD scale, so for example, kappa goes like uh, QCD scale to the cube or some, you know, some constant times the QCD scale to the cube. So you expect kappa to scale as the QCD scale to the cube. So here, this, this is parameterized by this, uh, this uh, quantity Xi. Xi is the ratio of the new QCD scale over the standard model QCD. So for example, for this scenario, Xi would be 1,000. Right? So your pion mass squared would be 1,000 times heavier than uh, what the standard model would be. And F pi goes like, um, goes like just one order of QCD, so it's QC chi, um, so your, your um, Mass squared, wait, is this chi squared? Yeah, this, is, this should be chi squared, sorry. <laughs> I swear the, the numerics will be correct at the end. <laughs> and the other thing that Toby was mentioning is that, of course, this uh, pion masses depend on the quark masses as well. So uh, the, uh, I will go in the next slide actually, but the uh, uh, chiral symmetry breaking like, immediately triggers uh, an electroweak symmetry breaking, breaking because you will have a Higgs QQ bar term right in your in your Lagrangian, and when QQ bar gets a vacuum expectation value, you will have a tadpole. You will create a tadpole for the Higgs uh, Higgs uh, potential, and that will immediately trigger an electroweak symmetry breaking even before the in this case before the the thermal breaking of the, the electroweak symmetry. So this, of course, happens in the standard model as well. It's just the QCD term, the tadpole term is much smaller, and the electroweak symmetry has already broken by the thermal corrections. Yes, John? Just want to make sure I heard you. The scaling there looks right to me, right? Because that pi squared is like, it's linear on that. Oh, this is m pi squared. That's right. This is, this is because it's m pi squared. OK, yes, yes, yes. I was correct. OK, good, good, good. Yes. So this is the compared to the m pi squared. Yes. Don't you change the number of Yes, exactly. So the other thing, the other thing that changes is you have a lot more pions, actually. From the what? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Yeah, NF is six basically in this scenario. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, 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 it's several things. Yeah, yeah. You, you change the, flavor, the number of flavors that are light as well, as well as you, know, you have this extra term that's coming from the, the scalar interactions. But you do both, that's true. Um, 
but right. So, so it's basically you have like one parameter is phi over m star, and you kind of fix that how many number of quarks you want light, and then you fix whatever phi over m star that gives you the correct QCD scale or the the, the QCD scale that you want. Does that make sense? And of course, you can only make it so high because phi over m star can be at most one, right? You don't want it to be one even because uh, it's an effective, effective uh, interaction in a way. So, you know, if you, if you, have, if you set it to one, the QCD scale can be only so high and can't be higher than that with the, the effective theory you have. But, you know, I've been saying that yeah, you have more massless quarks. Of course, you know, you can, uh, in the new confined phase, you can write, uh, uh, you can use chiral symmetry breaking, or, you know, your, your chiral symmetry breaking will be a bit different than the standard model. So it will be a SU6 cross SU6 breaking into an SU6 diagonal, because again, you have six massless quarks. So you will have more pions actually than uh, what, you, what you would expect with just two massless quarks. So in this scenario, if you use just a, a chiral perturbation theory, this is you know, very similar to what you would do in the standard model. Here, U is our pion, uh, pion matrix. These are pi A are the, the pion fields. And uh, the chiral Lagrange, uh, the, the, um, the effective Lagrangian uh, you know, will be this. Here, you have the, the tadpole term for the Higgs, right? This is H is the Higgs field, Y, uh, so the top U kappa is the most important one, and kappa is the QQ bar condensed scale in a way. And this M is a matrix that gives you the, the uh, this is the quark ma mass matrix, which you can find, use to find the pion mass matrix. But at the end, you will have a lot more pions. Uh, for example, for, um, yes, this is still using the, yeah, this is using uh, two different values of chi. One is 500, one is 1,000, but, at, but you will have 35 pions, uh, pions in, for either case, and this is giving you an idea of this, the mass scale of, the, of those pions. For example, you will have um, this x axis is the pion mass, and y is the number of pions with that mass, right? So you will have some pions with, um, with uh, you know, 10 GeV mass, a few GeV mass, you will have some pions with hundreds of GeV mass and uh, some pions up to a TeV for, for a QCD scale of a TeV or around a TeV, right? But at the, I think if you sum them up, there are 35 pions in either case. <coughs> and the, 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 um, the one quantity that's important for setting the pion masses is this C, which is again the, the new QCD scale over the, the standard model QCD scale, but also they depend on the, the pi, uh, quark masses that are, uh, you know, that are in the pions, and you know, these, there are, for example, TT bar pions here as well, right? Because they, they, can, they can hadronize in this, uh, in this scenario, um, in this scenario, and like, that depends on the, the, the um, mass of the, uh, the, the, the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs field, and the, the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs field will change in the scenario as well, because there is, again, there is this tadpole term that depends on the QCD scale. So there's the pion masses depends on the lambda QCD over lambda QCD standard model, and then VH is the new uh, Higgs wave over the standard model Higgs wave. This is just parametrizing parametrizing the pion masses with respect to the standard model waves. And to find the, the, the Higgs wave, you, know, you do a, a finite, temperature, uh, finite temperature field theory, right? you look at the finite temperature Higgs potential, and in this scenario we are not assuming that the, the scalar field phi couples with the Higgs field, so scalar field phi does not mix with the Higgs field, but we did look at a scenario where phi and Higgs uh, mix as well. This is just a, a much easier case. There are you know, a, few, a few different... Uh, like a few in uh, so the, the, the reason why we coupled the Higgs to the, to the scalar field was actually to get back the, the uh, lambda QCD to the standard model. So we wanted a basically a flip-flop kind of phase transition scenario where the, this phi has a web and then Higgs gets a vacuum expectation value, electric symmetry breaking, and then that can trigger a symmetry restoration for the phi field, which then pushes the phi web to zero, which then recovers the, the QCD scale, standard model QCD scale. So that's a nice scenario. But if you couple, so yeah, if you do that, the, I mean, you, have, you kind of have two very separate scales, so you need to be careful with your parameters to get back to the standard model, basically. It's not, I mean, it's a, it's a thing, you do it if you want to do it, let's say. Yes, John. 
Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, it will, it will always be that. I mean, it's, having that doesn't change the phase transition or anything. It's, yeah, you can have it. It's just if you want to, if you want to make that do something specific, that becomes harder. Sure. Yeah. Um, where, where was I? Yes. So the one interesting thing is, of course, you have the tadpole term, and for when you look at the the, the finite temperature Higgs, so when the quarks hadronize, you don't have quark degrees of freedom anymore. So for the finite temperature Higgs potential, the most important corrections are from the the top you know top uh, top fermion, right? You know top, top quark, which is a fermion. But here you don't really have any fermions anymore. Of course, you have the leptons, but they are very light, so their their couplings to the Higgs field are not as impo as that important, basically. But since everything hadronized, you only have mesonic contributions, so like scalar contributions, basically. So you know, if you do the thermal corrections, you only have you co you have corrections from the from the mesons, and again, you have 35 of them, right? And also for the the, the phi field, if you are looking at the the finite temperature potential of the phi field, the gluon condensate will contribute to the singlet potential. All right. So and. Um, Yes, as I said, this, in this scenario, when QCD confines, you have hadrons and not quarks. But um, you know, at some point, you want to return back to the, the standard model. And when you do this, for example, this is um, again the same um, same C values, C of 500 and C of 1,000. Uh, this is the Higgs web versus the temperature, at very high temperatures, you, have, you still have electroweak symmetry restoration, so Higgs web is zero, here, zero is here, not at the, the bottom. And then this is when the QCD, uh, con QCD confinement happens. When QCD confinement happens, you have the tadpole term, right? So you, have, you get this uh, transition to a non-zero Higgs web, and this Higgs web does depend on the QCD scale, because it just depends on the tadpole. So for example, for a QCD, QCD confinement of 400 GeV, your Higgs web is about 450 GeV. If it is 200 GeV, your, QCD, uh, your Higgs web will be about 300 GeV. So it's not, yes? So what's triggering that second Oh, very good. Is that, is, that is uh, model dependent, let's <laughs> say. This we just assume, we put in by hand. This is again to go, well, you assume that when the, the, the QCD scale goes back to the standard model, everything goes back to the standard model. And this, uh, so, so for, for the, the, this WIMP dark matter scenario to work, you want that, you want the return to the standard model to happen uh, below a temperature when dark matter would have frozen out anyway. So this is basically a, a theoretical limit, sorry, what? Which is about 10 GeV or so. And when the QCD kind of, you know, your QCD can be deconfined or not, but it will just change the contribution to the Higgs web coming from the QCD tadpole, which becomes less important as you fall, up, you know, fall below 250 GeV anyway. So that, that, yeah. that It is, um, it is a model dependent, model dependent way. It's basically what you, this is what you pick, and then you build your model to get to that temperature. Yes. The, the deconfine does not need to happen. It's just you need to go back to standard model before BBN, right? So if you go back to standard model below one GeV, like say 100 MeV, you don't deconfine, right? You just you know, your just QCD scale dynamically changes basically, but you stay you stay at the confined phase. Just yeah, 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 yeah. So Higgs web, I, let, let me see. Sorry, we don't give the, the Higgs web here, but it is a param the, the Higgs web depends on the QCD scale. So if you are changing the QCD scale dynamically, your Higgs web will, will change as well. All right. So a bit, okay, so Tim and I, when we first looked at this new, uh, new QCD uh, cosmological history, we were specifically thinking about biogenesis, and so the Higgs web was very important for us like, to find the Higgs web and when the Higgs transition will happen because uh, we were using sphalerons. But, but for dark matter scenario, that part is not as important. Sorry, a question, yes. You have a 6 plus 6 theory, so you have a lot more mesons than the standard model. 
No, it's not energy, this is temperature. It's like, like really high energy and high temperature are very different things. Yeah, yeah. So you will, you will never see those, uh, those mesons unless you build a one TeV temperature collider. Yeah. Right, so again, this, um, this talk is about dark matter. <laughs> So if we look at what happens to dark matter interactions uh, in this cosmology, so here the one side is uh, when the dark matter, you know, dark, our dark matter particles, you know, let's assume there are just some Dirac fermions, chi and chi bar, with some, uh, with some Dirac mass, mass m chi, and we will assume two different interactions, uh, or two different mediators. One is a vector mediator, a me vector mediator and a scalar mediator, and you can turn this on and off, like one at a time if you want. We were just like looking at them. Uh, we, we actually do look at them separately, but you can also have them at the same time. So this is a very, you know, very vanilla interaction. This here, mv is the vector mediator mass. Here, ms is the vector media, uh, scalar mediator mass. That lambda and beta are some some coupling constants, right? You know, some order one coupling constants by assumes. And so this is, you know, these are the interactions for high temperature or temperatures above the QCD confinement scale. So your um, your degrees of freedom are quarks. When QCD confines, now your dark matter needs to annihilate, can only annihilate into hadrons, like pions, right? Because QCD has confined. So you actually need to kind of revert, uh, convert your uh, Lagrangian to to one with you know interactions with pions and not not just quarks because those are not your degrees of freedom anymore. And when you do that, which um, uh, one of our collaborators, Michael Waterbury, uh, did, the, did the, these calculations, and if you do this for vector mediators, so instead of quarks, now you are uh, you know you are using the the pion pion states. And for the vector mediator case, you end up with, uh, with this term. So this is still goes like m, 1 over m squared, and then yeah, now your uh, dark matter is interacting with, uh, with, with the pion fields. So you can see that for the vector mediator, there's not much change really. This FABC are just the, the uh, structure constants for, uh, for SU6, right? And then this is the, the generators of SU6. So the, for, the, for, for the vector mediator, the, the most change is that your pions are massive, and I showed you the mass of the pions. They, are, you know, they scale with the QCD scale and the Higgs web, basically. So instead of annihilating into massless or very light quarks, now you will be annihilating into heavy hadrons. So you, of course, your annihilation cross-section will change because now your final states are, are heavy and possibly you know, maybe some of them are heavier than, your, heavier than your dark matter as well. For the scalar mediator though, if you do this, if you, if you do this exercise, the scalar mediator cross-section actually goes like kappa over f pi square. And remember, kappa scales like lambda QCD cubed, f pi scales like lambda QCD square. So this term actually depends on one power of lambda QCD. So there will be a QCD enhancement in this cross-section, and then you still pay a price for heavy, heavy hadrons, but not as much. Yeah, beta is, you know, the, uh, technically you have flavors here, you know, chi, uh, sorry, QI, QJ, maybe you have some flavor changing, but you can just assume that to be diagonal, and then it's just, you know, and if you want, you can have all the quarks coupled with the same strength or different strength. Sorry, but beta is just some order one number, yes. Uh, I don't know what you mean, sorry, say it again? The, the fact that um, for the scalar mediator you got right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the Right. Case. Well, like here you have a scale that's coming from the you know there's a there's an energy scale here in a way at the the right. delta mu, right? So that's carried by yes. Oh, this, oh yes, yes, very good, very good, yes. So, yes. Um, you have that only when there's a scalar mediator? Yes, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and it's, you're getting that term because there's a QQR constant? Yes, exactly. So, why, if I have a scalar mediator, why don't I have the same term in the standard model just with a smaller? Yes, uh, I, I, I think you should. 
do. You do. Yeah, yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you should have it with just standard model as well. It's just very, very small compared to the dark matter masses that you would probably look at. I will show you. Yeah, very good. Sorry. Thanks for, thanks for reminding me to talk about this. This term is basically an addition to the, to the dark matter mass, the, the fermion dark matter, dark mass, right? Because this comes from QQ bar condensate, basically. This is effectively a mass term. And you can just see that it's like kappa over, kappa over ms square, right? And you should have this for standard model as well. Like standard model confinement should give you this term as well. It's just in the standard model, it will be, it will be very, very small. So uh, this is the MS squares that I will show you. I mean, kappa, you know, in the standard model is like 250 MeV or so. And then MS square, you want it to be, you need it to be large because we haven't observed in dark matter yet. So it, it becomes a very, very small correction. And even in this case, it is not that much of a large correction. And I will show it to you on the plots. So if we look at this for uh, like numerically, so here this is the case for a vector mediator. Again, the, the interaction terms go from this to when the, uh, when the confinement happens to, to this basically. And the annihilation cross-section is independent of the confinement scale. But as I said, uh, since now your, uh, our hadrons are massive, uh, you, get, you pay a price for that. So in these plus the, the solid lines are for the standard scenario. So this is a standard model. So this case, you know, basically assuming that this case continues up to, uh, you know, one GeV temperature or so. And the dotted and dashed, so the dotted is C equals 1000 and the dashed is C equals uh, 500, uh, 500. So it's a, um, what are the, yeah, the QCD scale is just, QC is lambda QCD over lambda standard model. And this is setting the vector mediator scale to one GeV, the blue lines, and for the green lines with the vector mediator is set to one TeV. So this is, uh, the x-axis is the, the chi uh, uh, mass of the dark matter, and this is the, the scale, the, the annihilation cross-section, or the thermally averaged uh, annihilation cross-section times, uh, times velocity. And you see the, with the new QCD, the, the cross-section actually gets lower. Again, this is because you have uh, massive, uh, massive final states, and so you pay that, you pay that pr price. But since the annihilation cross-section uh, becomes smaller, now you need, uh, you end up with you know, more dark matter than you would observe in many cases. So you actually need the vector mediator scale to be, to be even lower to get the right, right dark matter density. So the vector mediator case actually get, does worse in this cosmological history. So if you, you yeah, know, wait. Sorry, yeah. So if you, if you look at the constraints from, for example, xenon, xenon 110, so the, the most vanilla scenario, again, is the solid line, which was already excluded. If we look at our new cosmological history, they are more excluded, in a way. <laughs> so you just, you does worse for the, you do worse for it, victim mediated. Yes, John? So you were saying that because there's certain equal components to all quarks, right? Like if I couple this guy just to the top quark, yep. the direct connection should be bad. Like, uh, no. The, yeah, if you if you couple down the one quark, the cross section will even be smaller, and then you will uh, it will be worse. Yeah. No, you Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, there's a, I mean, the direct detection constraint is to, to nucleons. That's right. Yeah. 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 Yeah
would mean that you can uh, be less constrained by direct detection experiments. This is the, the, the cross-section at high temperatures, right? The cross-section now at the colliders is the zero temperature, the normal QCD cross-section. That's why you don't get an enhancement, and that's why you would have, a, you would have the difference between the, the constraints, basically, from experiments that are running now at zero temperature. So if you, if you look at a similar plot for, um, for the cross section, uh, analyzing cross section versus the dark matter mass, the solid lines are again the normal QCD for, different, uh, for two different values of the scalar mediator. So the green is 10 to 7 GeV and uh, blue is 10 to the 6 GeV scalar mediator. And the, the, when you change the QCD scale, you see that the dotted and dashed lines are different and these bumps are different uh, quarks coming into, um, into resonance or going out of resonance, if you, if you will. So, and you can, oh, what do I think? Yes, so for the scalar case, you can also look at, the, for example, the freeze-out temperature. So this is for, again, the standard scenario. This little bump is when, the, when your dark matter is above the, the top quark mass, so it can also decay into top quarks. So the freeze-out temperature drops, basically, because of that. But uh, for, for with the new, uh, if you have a higher QCD confinement scale, your freeze-out temperature will be lower because it's just your cross-section is much higher, basically. So this is the increasing cross-section, right? So your, your freeze-out temperature will be lower. Your, the freeze-out will be happening, happening later and later. And um, so this is, and this, bottom plot is showing the dark matter number density versus dark matter mass. This is the observed value. And you see uh, you need, um, <coughs> excuse me, the, the, uh, so this is the, 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 the solid lines are again the standard scenario and the dashed lines are for, for the QCD, the higher QCD confinement scale. And you see when the, the normal QCD where you would have predicted a much higher number density, in this case you would be predicting a lower density or you will be setting a lower density because your cross section got this uh, QCD enhancement uh, at, the, the, uh, at the freeze out. And this translates into, a, again, a rosier picture for direct detection, uh, direct detection experiments. So this blue region or the shaded region is the excluded region for, uh, by, by Xenon 110. And uh, the, the solid line, which is a standard scenario, the, the, the generic WIMP in a standard cosmological history, basically, is you know, excluded for these, for these masses and interactions, whereas if you raise your QCD confinement scale, now you can have a, a, a parameter, you know, a large parameter space kind of opens up for you know, WIMP masses and, um, and scalar, uh, scalar, scalar masses of about 10 to the 6 GB or so. And here, this is um, what John had uh, pointed out the, the, the difference in the dark or the, the, the little bump you get to the dark matter mass. So this, is, this plot is for dark matter mass at zero temperature, but at high temperature you would get a correction to the dark matter mass. So it changes the analyzing cross section just a bit, right, because you are getting that uh, the, your dark matter mass could be a bit different. So, and it depends on the sign of beta, for example, uh, sign of beta. So the blue, the, sorry, the black lines are for beta larger than zero and the, the red lines are beta smaller than, smaller than zero. So you get either heavier or just a little heavier or just a little lighter, but you can see that it is mostly affecting dark matter masses. For this case, it's 100 GV or less, but for a standard model, this would be even smaller. Like if your dark matter is like very, very light, basically, then you might see some effect. Or you might worry about some effects, sorry, not see, but yeah. So, um, I guess this is just a bit hard, Like, um, sort of flavor analysis of these class of models. Has that been done yet? No. Okay. No, yeah. We were just assuming flavor diagonal and, we took the and, and, <laughs> and, and democratic uh, couplings, yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, wait, was this a half an hour? 
spell? Oh, is it an R bell? Okay. <laughs> I was like, I can't be that fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 but it's okay because this was an, you know, it's like an amazing, amazing model, right? And I am not gonna go into obviously uh, biogenesis stuff, which was great. But someone asked about scalars and scalar masses and stuff. This was specifically to produce the Bayonet symmetry. Okay, this is not the Wimp Dark Matter scenario. And here we coupled the phi field to the Higgs field, so there was a mixing between the the phi and the Higgs. And on this plot, these blue dots are where you can produce the correct Bayana symmetry. So, and this is for you know, specific MS values that we looked at. So this MS is the scale of the, the effective, uh, effective operator between the phi and the gluons. So if, you, if we had looked at uh, finer MS values, you can imagine that this whole parameter region is going to be a scan basic or will be filled to give you the correct Bayana symmetry. And then here there are, um, there are um, the, the, the constraints from, from Higgs mixing. So for example, there's this opal and lock constraints from Higgs decays to BB, BB bar or some scalar field that mixes with the Higgs decays to BB bar. And then these are maybe future, uh, the future parameter space that a Higgs factor or Z factor can look at. Again, this, this phi, uh, here this, this parameter space was chosen to produce the Baryon symmetry. And this was before, the, before we thought about that matter. So it's just, I wanted to give, show this for people who were interested in the phi field. And you can see that the phi mass is of order 10 GeV basically, and the coupling, um, the mixing angle is a bit small, and that's why there are really no, no constraints yet. And if, uh, so if you take the phi, uh, if you take the axion like particle constraints of like phi GG dual kind of terms, the limit is uh, M star of 3 TeV. So we show here 1.5 TV, just assuming that maybe the constraints are a bit uh, relaxed for a phi GG kind of term, but we haven't looked at a phi GG term. Uh, we haven't looked at collided constraints for a phi GG term. All right, yeah, and that's it. Um. <laughs> <laughs>